Thanks for coming and thank you for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Ionis Samardinos, who is at the uh, University of Crete. He's come full circle. I take it you better never than late, as someone used to always say. Ionis <laughs> um, uh, got his uh, bachelor's in computer science from the uh, University of Crete, and now he is an associate professor there, so that's a full circle. And it turns out that he got his PhD from the intelligence systems program here, and now he's back giving a lecture, and I just talked to him for an hour, and we had so many things in common, and he's doing so much work uh, that's exciting to the center that um, I am resigning as the Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences, and I'm replacing myself with him. <laughs> so we have him. And then we'll see what happens at Carnegie. <laughs> So uh, uh, Jonas has done all kinds of great work in um, causal discovery. He's done uh, logic-based approaches, which I'll tell you about today. Um, he's done really interesting work on uh, approaches that use mixed variable sets, right? You have discrete variables, you have continuous variables, and you have most data sets, which include some of each. Right? So he's pioneered a lot of work on that. And he's done a lot of really great work on the domain that combines the algorithms and techniques with the new data that's kind of becoming available in single cell cytometry measurements for, for quite a long time. Um, he's had uh, many different awards. I will just tell you a couple of them. Uh, he just, in no November 14, won the Berenger Ingelheim Cancer Researcher Award for the best poster abstract of the year. Uh, he has won one of the most cited papers of 2010, uh, one of the best performances in the competition of the first causality challenge. Um, and in 2005, uh, he co-wrote a paper with Alexander Statnikov and a few others that made science direct top 25 hottest articles. So with that, uh, let me introduce Ionis and, and, and thank him for, for, for coming. Thank you very much. I'll start the timer so I don't... Uh, let me just say I'm very happy, first of all, to be back in Pittsburgh. It's, uh, you know, uh, always a place where my heart is. And I would, I'm honored uh, by the invitation. I'd really like to thank uh, my hosts uh, here. Uh, so <clears throat> I'll be presenting today uh, an introduction and some uh, algorithms and results and examples on the logic-based uh, integrative causal uh, discovery. I apologize to the people who uh, really know uh, the who have discovered the causal discovery approaches for uh, the short introduction, but I think it's going to be useful to the uh, rest of the audience. So <clears throat> the basic idea is, uh, first of all, that, that usually <clears throat> we have a lot of data sets, and the, the typical scenario in science is that um, several uh, scientists <clears throat> measure the same system. Um, actually, I, I can fix this. It's okay, I need to move. Uh, I had too much coffee. Okay, uh, so <clears throat> imagine uh, a doctor measures, uh, wants to study breast cancer, and they have a cohort study, uh, and they measure some uh, potential risk factors, and the same uh, thing is true for a, a biologist who measures mostly uh, study the same disease but with uh, molecular quantities, and then maybe some other uh, scientists perform clinical experiments. So here you have some data that comes from uh, <coughs> manipulated uh, an intervention uh, distribution, measuring different things. So you can see here, if you pull all the data together available from this system, uh, that have big blocks missing. And in statistics, these are called missing by design. Uh, it was never intended, never. The, the people didn't think about measuring them. So it's a special type of missingness here. And the other thing is that uh, this distribution, since uh, you intervened upon the system, is uh, different than this one even on the common uh, variables. Okay, so um, what people usually do is analyze each data set by its own right. Okay, so this uh, doctor is going to find some, uh, for example, correlations and call them uh, risk factors. Uh, same thing for this um, uh, biologist. And here, because we have a randomized control trial, maybe uh, find some uh, cause of causes. But in any case, what happens is that these results are published and then the human 
brain has to read that and try to figure out what is happening in the human. Okay? So, <clears throat> can we do better than that? Can we actually learn from all these data sets that are different, different distributions, measuring different things at different conditions? And uh, oh, we know that the data cannot be pulled together uh, because of, uh, first of all, missing variables, and secondly, because we have uh, different experimental conditions. However, there is something common in all the data sets. And what is common is not the distribution, not the statistical distribution, but the causal model they come from. So they all come from the same causal model. That's the idea, the human body. Um, and that's what we're going to use to uh, connect these data sets. So uh, the problem we are going to try to solve is how to learn causal graphs and causal models that uh, when you when you feed them in all the data sets, uh, they explain and fit all, all the data. Uh, and they fit the data in the interventional distributions when you take this graph and you simulate the effect of the intervention in time, for example. Or uh, they fit the data in this distribution when you only look, when you marginalize and only look at those variables. Okay? <coughs> so, uh, first of all, what type of uh, causal models are we going to use? Uh, we're going to use uh, what is called semi Markov causal graphs. This is an extension of Bayesian networks that also considers the possibility of a model, the possibility of a lazy compound. So uh, it allows deep types of edges, it allows direct uh, edge, direct edges, uh, and bi direct edges. And the meaning is that the bi direct edges represent compounding. The fact that neither x goes to y uh, nor the reverse, but instead there's a latent compound factor in the two. Okay, so that, that's the semantic of uh, the same. And you could potentially have both types of edges uh, between them. You know. What is not allowed is uh, direct cycles and the presence of feedback because it creates a lot of uh, problems, uh, both algorithmically and semantically. So let's just assume no cycles but are allowed. So <laughs> this is the type of models we're going to work with. I think more realistic than Bayesian networks and Bayesian variables. And of course, um, the, the, this is parameterized by uh, joint probability distribution. So you have the numbers, the quantity by the distribution, and you have a structure uh, that tells you about the causality in, in uh, your system. Now, something needs to be connecting the two, and these are the causal assumptions. So, it's not the case that you can have any numbers here given some graph. Okay? <clears throat> so, what are these um, causal assumptions? Will uh, both the algorithms and the assumptions are stated in terms of conditional dependencies and independence? Okay, so uh, an independent means essentially, if you, if you look at it like this, as an equation in probabilities, that uh, you, you have some belief about the distribution of x when you know the values of z. And if you additionally give information about y, some extra information, uh, these don't change. That means that y gives no information for x uh, when you know z, and vice versa, it's uh, symmetric. Uh, and we know this uh, as this independent. And if uh, given what additional is the given uh, y, this probability distribution changes, uh, your beliefs change, then these are dependent, conditional dependent. So <clears throat> formalizing causality, uh, the basic assumption, uh, technically uh, and formally uh, stated, is that every variable is independent of its non effects given its direct causes. So um, this is not very intuitive, but it encompasses also uh, some, some more intuitive notions that we have about causality, namely that if you know the direct causes of a variable, then indirect causes doesn't give you additional information. It's a special case of this rule. And also that if you know the direct causes of a variable, Confounded variables don't give you extra information. 
again, this cut, this rule captures both cases. So let's see, if we apply this rule uh, here, for example, for Z, it tells us that uh, Z uh, as a variable, given its direct causes, so given X, is independent of its non-effect. Uh, it doesn't have any effect, so everything else is a non-effect. So Z is independent of Y given X. Okay. Uh, so that's uh, <clears throat> what we can infer from the assumption connecting uh, a graph with something that we should see in our data with dependency from independence. And the second assu major assumption is that uh, what is called the causal faithfulness assumption is that these are the only dependencies that you have, the independencies that stem from the causal structure uh, graph. So everything else you would expect to be a dependent. That's the faithfulness assumption. Now, uh, uh, given the actions of probability and some of the independencies, you can prove more independencies. And the question arises is how can we get all independencies? And uh, these are given by a criterion that is called M separation. It's a graphical criterion which looks at the graph and tells you uh, what independencies you should expect in your data based on this graph, on this causal graph. So uh, this is the M separation criterion that I'm going to quickly uh, review and uh, define. And it defines, uh, it's based on defining path, uh, properties on paths. So uh, we'll talk about M connecting paths and you can think of them as uh, water pipes that uh, let information flow, creating dependence. And separated paths, essentially, that are blocked pipelines that don't let information flow. So, if you have at least one end connecting path, uh, you would expect dependence. And if you have no end connecting path, you would expect independence. Now, which paths are end connecting? Let's see. If you take the path on variables x1 to xn, then what a <coughs> given uh, condition set B. What you need to do is like take every triplet on this path, every essentially two edges, and check whether these two edges collide or not. If they collide, the path is open, the, the pipe lets information flow to a few condition on its side or any of its descendants. And if this is a not a collider, uh, then it's the opposite, it's the reverse situation. You should not condition on the uh, middle of the node to let information flow. So basically, there's a basic asymmetry between colliders and non-colliders. And this asymmetry is at the foundation <coughs> that allows the algorithms dis to discover the arrow of causation. Uh, they, they separate between uh, this case where you have the arrows collide against <coughs> all other cases. OK? So uh, basically, the main message is that we have uh, properties of paths telling us whether uh, some uh, dependencies or independencies should be observed on the data. Okay, so if uh, now we have a way, if we know the causal model, uh, to uh, use this criterion and check some of the dependencies and independencies that should be called in the data, okay, that we should see in the data. But of course, we usually have the reverse situation. We have the data, and we are looking for the graph. OK? <clears throat> so from the data, we can actually uh, infer some uh, the statistical dependencies and independence. How do we do this? By running conditional independence uh, statistical tests. If you have continuous variables, you could run uh, a, a simple linear test on the partial correlation. If you have discrete, you can run a, uh, a G squared test. If you have uh, a survival variable, you can run a Cox regression based test, and so forth. But this is what statistics have been doing for 100 years now devising uh, dependence and independent, uh, independence tests uh, for different types of variables. And different types of so, uh, 
I assume we have a way to now the question is like how do we go to the next step from here to here to a graph that um, <clears throat> uh, is consistent with these dependencies and dependencies that's the problem and <clears throat> the problem becomes even uh, more complicated because we could have lots of solutions that are equivalent but uh, lots of graphs that entail the same set of dependencies and dependencies okay? uh, and unfortunately, uh, for some types of graphs, the set of solutions you can represent compactly with another type of graph. But for semi-Markov causal models uh, that we work with here, you cannot represent this set of solutions with one graph. OK, so um, as I said, now <coughs> in, uh, these uh, independencies correspond, as we said, to the presence or absence of M connected bands. So you have the data, you find the dependencies and dependencies, and you know the existence or absence of some types of paths. And you're trying to find all the causal models that are consistent with that. And um, there are uh, some incomplete algorithms to do that, such as the path causal inference algorithm uh, discovered here. That, that can do that efficiently um, but what is more difficult of course is when you have lots of different and heterogeneous data sets that's when the big problems or at least the new problems are right these data sets measure overlapping variable sets they don't measure the same variable and they measure them under different uh, interventions under different experimental conditions or they could be measured in under different sampling conditions. That creates another set of problems. Let me explain. Uh, so uh, interventions, uh, you, uh, you can think of them as, uh, I mean, the idea of interventions are randomized <coughs> control trials. So imagine you uh, take a group of people and you randomly split them to um, two groups. One group you force them to eat uh, junk food, and the other ones you forbid them uh, from eating uh, junk food. Uh, maybe you actually put mice here, but it doesn't work with the uh, <laughs> But anyway, uh, and then you check the association uh, between eating uh, junk food and, and heart disease. Okay? So by doing this, <clears throat> what happens is that no app, nothing, uh, no co-founder no, no, no other cause can um, cause someone to like eat more junk food and also at the same time uh, heart disease. The only thing that uh, causes uh, whether you eat or not junk food is the experimenter. So how do we simulate this effect of the experimenter of the intervention? The way we uh, simulate it, if we know the true graph, is uh, and we know we intervene on B since nothing uh, else is causing B, nothing affects B, but the experimenter, uh, for TV, uh, junk food or not. Uh, we remove, we amputate the graph and remove the edges that are in time to B. So, this, this way we simulate if we know the causal model the effect of an intervention, okay, and we have the manipulated graph that we denote with the superscript. Uh, and the nodes that we have manipulated upon. The edges coming into B. Okay, so now <clears throat> the problem, if we have an interventional data set, the problem becomes that the constraints here regard not the initial graph, <clears throat> but the graph after you remove everything that's coming into B. You're looking in for a graph that explains all these dependencies and dependencies after you remove some edges. Okay. All right, what about selection bias? And this is uh, a thorny issue that is hidden under the carpet many, many times. So imagine, imagine you're, uh, doing, you, you're gathering some data, but because it's convenient, you actually uh, get the data only from uh, people that are on the internet. Okay. Then your sample contains only people that are on the internet, not, not the other, uh, not people uh, not connected. So 
in there, you, you may have a different distribution of certain uh, quantities, for example. Okay? Uh, in this case, if you're measuring uh, the, the percentage of people believing in evolution and uh, creation, uh, it's plausible that you're going to find a different um, distribution if you only sample from uh, people on the internet. Okay, so how can we model this situation? And actually, this is very common, both in business and in medicine. Uh, a case where we know that we have selection bias is when you have case control studies. Okay, then you select uh, based on um, some people having the disease. Okay? Uh, but in business, it's also super important because essentially every database has selection bias. Every business samples from their own clients. Uh, so for example, uh, a business operating in Pittsburgh, um, mostly is, is sampling from uh, people uh, from Pittsburgh, okay? Who may have a different distribution of certain uh, properties than say Idaho, right? So if you wanna run your algorithms, your code of discovery algorithms, you have to consider this. Okay, so how do we model this? where uh, let's in include an extra variable uh, that notes whether uh, a, an object has been selected or not to be in our, our database, in our sample. And of course, for all objects in our database, this has value one. But now we can have an edge here saying that whether you're included or not depends on, say, the disease, the presence of the disease or not, or whether you're in Pittsburgh or not, and so forth. So once we do this, we realize that our data are conditioned on x equals one. And the M separation criteria tells you that, well, if you condition on this node, you will find a curious association between these two, a curious association between these two that doesn't exist in the general population, okay? So this is again like uh, some data sets that we try to co-analyze may have this uh, selection bias or not, or we don't know. Okay, so what we need to do is actually, again, somehow encode in our constraints that we're looking for M connecting paths or uh, M separating paths, not in the original graph uh, that we're trying to find, but in the graph after we take into consideration that we condition on S. Okay, all right, so <clears throat> putting all this together, we just need to find a way to impose these constraints. Uh, the fact that some end connecting paths are there or absent after we consider selection, after we consider manipulation. And the way we do this is, that's the, the basic idea. Uh, you should get the hint by the title of this talk, logic-based uh, causal analysis, that we convert them into logical constraints. So here I have some propositional variables there. It's zero or one. Uh, denoting, uh, and it's, it's one. If it's one, that means that the edge A to B exists in the causal graph. Or um, this could be a bi directional edge, for example. Okay? So, uh, as I said, from the data, we have independences. They denote some constraints on the path, and then we need to find a way to turn this into logic. And solving this problem will give us all, will correspond to the causal graphs that are uh, plausible and fit our data. How do we do this? Let me show you an example. Let's say this is, uh, we have three variables, and we discover one independence, A to C, given the empty set. Now, we know that this means that if we take into account the fact that, um, uh, and, and we manipulate B. This means that if we, we are looking for a graph such that when we remove the edges to B, there's no end connecting path between this and this given the empty set. So uh, <clears throat> this edge shouldn't be there, okay, because uh, otherwise, no matter what, this two would be end connected, uh, which means that. This is not true, and this is not true, and this is not true. And another constraint is that this path shouldn't be there. 
because if it is, even if we remove all edges incoming to B, there should still be an unconnected path. So we exclude this possibility too, and these are the only possibilities, actually, in this case, and we end up with this logic formula. Now, um, also, uh, let's see a solution of this formula. Okay, uh, we have nine variables, essentially, uh, three possibilities for uh, of edges for three for every pair of variables. So these are all our propositional variables. This is a truth assignment that solves the propositional uh, formula that we have, and it corresponds to this uh, graph. So this is a graph that after you remove all edges uh, into B, uh, it gives you this independence. It tells this independence. And if you generate all truth assignments that solve the constraint, uh, you get all solutions. Okay, so <clears throat> um, the algorithm uh, or the general approach of the type, the template, first of all, that you perform the te as many tests as you want or you can or you have time for, and you discover as many dependencies and dependencies you can from the multiple data sets. So the input is, the first input is whether an independence exists or not. Then you also need to encode meta information about your data set. What is this meta information? It's whether some variable was used, uh, was manipulated or not, or we don't know. Okay, so for each variable and data set, you dictate whether it was manipulated in that data set or it was manipulated, you know it wasn't, or you did it unknown. And uh, the same is uh, for whether a variable has been used for selection or not. Uh, or otherwise you leave it unknown and leave the possibility open. And on top of that, you could include constraints uh, that uh, about prior knowledge. You can say, for example, that, well, I know that this gene is regulating that gene, maybe directly or indirectly. So that corresponds to the presence of the path in the graph you're looking for. Or uh, in a business application, you ask the people and they tell you, uh, well, I, I know that the latency or in a quality of experience application that we work on, uh, people know that the, the latency of the network causes someone to uh, or the quality of experience lower, okay? So you you can encode you can encode in the algorithm this type the presence or absence of these uh, paths or edges. And how do you encode them? You encode them by using this uh, propositional variable. So uh, this notation here denotes a, a proposition a propositional variable that is the graph I'm looking at uh, for. X directly causes Y. If it takes the value of false. That means the edge is not there. If it is the value of one, that means the edge is there. Uh, this is bidirectional edges. Um, and also, there are variables that denote our knowledge whether a variable has been used for selection in data set D, or whether, whether a variable has, uh, X has been used for intervention in variable in uh, data set D. So the um, the input to the, the algorithm is uh, our knowledge about dependencies and dependencies encoded in these variables, denoting whether X and Y are M connected in uh, given Z in variable in data set D. The truth assignment to these variables about selection and the to these variables uh, taking our knowledge about the intervention. So, you set the truth values of as many of these variables as you want. Then the logic program is going to determine as many of the values of the other uh, the other variables as it can. And how does it do that with this logic program here? So this is an instance of an algorithm, a cause of discovery algorithm written in uh, first order logic. Uh, it's the APO algorithm we just presented in KPD. Uh, 
I'm actually the guy who discovered the video coding is uh, over there. You're almost for that piece. So let's see the constraints. Uh, some simple constraints. Uh, X has a indirect path to causal path to Y, if and only if X uh, has an edge to Y, or there is another node U and X causes U and U causes Y. For example, that that encodes essentially the properties of ancestry. And this constraint, uh, logic constraint, encodes the properties of uh, the constraint of accessibility. Then this complicated constraint holds in logic the M connection criteria. Okay, so the definition of M connection and M separation I show is encoded here in logic. So you input all your knowledge. And then you can ask, like, can you prove that, uh, say, uh, this edge exists in the graph, in any graph that satisfies all my, um, that fits in all my data? Okay? That's, that's a basic idea. Now, if you actually try to do that, I mean, you could. And as you can see, uh, you can write an algorithm in literally 10 lines of code. <coughs> of logical, but there are lots and lots of technical problems. Uh, I'm not going to go through in much detail, but everything in this problem is exponential. Okay? So there's an exponential possible number of dependencies. There's an exponential number of paths and corresponding constraints. There's an exponential number of solutions. All right? So <clears throat> it's not going to scale up. But there are certain smart things one can do. Uh, for example, uh, what some algorithms do in this area, instead of like trying all possible dependencies, the benefit is to try only the ones that FCI would. Uh, and, and probably for the specific data set, you, you're going to be fine. Um, another thing is to limit the conditioning set size. So you don't condition like on. 50 variables, just a, just a few. Usually that's enough in practice. How do you reduce the number of paths? Uh, well, uh, instead of using n separating paths, you can use another type of paths, for, uh, in some situations, called infusion paths that encode um, compactly the information for us. Um, that's more technical. The easiest uh, thing to understand is that you can also limit the maximum path length. So, you don't encode constraints for very long paths. You say, I'm looking for simpler explanations, essentially. Uh, and all the, most of these heuristics like uh, remove the property of completeness of your algorithm, but make it uh, much more scalable. Now, in terms of the logic formula, you need a clever way to encode the constraints. If you do it like a brute force, uh, you're going to end up like with you know, hundreds. So some tricks exist to uh, recursively encode paths instead of uh, brute force or uh, having constraints for uh, But once you have a logic formula, uh, people in constraint uh, satisfaction have been working for decades, and they have like really wonderful tools for solving these things, like uh, you know, extremely fast. Okay, and then. What about like uh, the fact that you have an exponential number of solutions? So, well, you could enumerate them all, but it's going to take an eternity. Or you can be a little more specific about what you would like to learn to discover. Uh, we call this the, the query-based approach, if you'd like, to causal discovery. So um, you query for a feature that you care. You, you say, can you prove to me that X causes Y? Or can you prove to me that uh, directly or indirectly? Or that it doesn't cause Y? So you you pose specific queries about features that, that you care about. Um, one, uh, another way to summarize some of these queries, to look at pairwise relationships, ask like, uh, does this always, in all my solutions, can you prove that in all my solutions causes that? And yes, you put a solid edge. Uh, and if uh, in no solution this causes that, uh, for example, in no solution directly, then you don't put the edge. 
and otherwise if in some solutions this is possible in some solutions but uh, not in others then uh, you have a dust edge and this way you at least summarize the pairwise relationships so solid edges present everywhere dust edges present some solutions and um, same thing for uh, endpoints okay Another big technical problem is that you, when you take the logic-based approach, is that you may have conflicts. Those uh, almost, you know, surely, mathematically speaking, you will have statistical errors in large problems. So uh, then that means you have an unsatisfied formula. What do you do? Okay, uh, again, it's a big problem, but uh, very quickly the idea is to convert your p-values from, from this test into some sort of uh, probability. And then, uh, since you cannot solve all of these constraints together, just try to find a subset that you can satisfy. Uh, for example, one easy way to find a subset is to start like satisfying as soon as you find a, a conflicting uh, constraint, you throw it away and you continue. Or you can be more fancy and try to solve an optimization, a constraint optimization problem but uh, at the expense of uh, much, much more computational overhead. Okay, so <laughs> the existing algorithms, uh, first of all, this approach, we, we started in 2010, and as you can see, like, from the list of papers here, um, it, uh, lots of algorithms have uh, appeared since then and, and keeps growing since. Uh, and they all make different choices depending on uh, the specific type of heterogeneity that they address um, choices in terms of the heuristics they use. Um, covering also a little bit the area in this uh, field, uh, I would like to extend uh, also to this work of by Kutina in 2015 that also tries to make to estimate causal effects and make all this quantitative. So. Uh, it uses the, the conversion of the logic and then uh, for each solution it solves uh, also the try to find the parameters and the causal effects that uh, the person may care about. <coughs> Another uh, work that we've done is a proof of concept that these ideas work in practice uh, and on real data sets uh, that affect. And also we recently presented a tutorial in uh, UAI um, last month where you can find more details, more references, and examples of just what I presented uh, so far. OK, so um, I would like also to make this a little more concrete with a business application. But if you prefer medical applications, uh, just substitute um, you know, your examples in your mind. So this is uh, a causal model that was constructed by experts in the insurance domain. Basically, what these people care about is uh, the costs that uh, each uh, person in um, uh, each client would uh, incur in the, in the company. So these are some of the variables in that model. Actually, the, the real model is larger. Okay, and you have the causal relationships uh, according to this expert at least about what causes these costs to increase or not. Now, based on this uh, model, let's suppose that we actually have the following data. Okay, so here we have this, the variables that uh, go into the model. Let's say a business has this uh, uh, data before they did any uh, interventions, but they don't measure these variables. So one business has this data but they don't measure these two variables. Uh, let's also say that uh, we, we have another data set, but it's a case control study, essentially, study on people uh, that they had anti-locks and equivalent uh, sample that didn't have anti-lock. And they, um, so they have some data, but and they also don't measure this variable. And let's say also that uh, this uh, company decided at some point to offer a promotion. A promotion uh, 
to instigate people to put some extra cushion in their pocket, okay? And uh, hoping that it's going to reduce the medical uh, cost. So then we also had uh, an intervention on data set here, okay? This is before the promotion, this is after the promotion, the same business, and this is like an independent case control study. And also, if you ask these people, they're going to give you some um, prior knowledge. For example, nothing causes age, uh, nothing causes the costs because they, they temporarily come like last. Okay. First, you measure all other variables and the cost uh, if they have an action in force. Uh, that the age uh, causes the cost, for example. Okay, so let's see what we get when we uh, put this in the algorithm and ask the algorithm, uh, first of all, just with the observational data, just with the observational data, uh, and we ask the algorithm, can you prove uh, any direct or indirect or possibly indirect causal relationships? Here is a graph that depicts the direct and indirect relationships that you can prove. Uh, things that are missing doesn't mean they are not there, means that uh, the logic-based uh, program cannot prove them. Okay, so uh, the first thing that I, I have to say is that uh, even just with observational data, you still find some causal relationships that hopefully is going to be useful to these people to increase their profit. Now, if in addition to that, you take into consideration prior knowledge, then you're able to prove even more, okay? Uh, and as far as I can see, even though we try to prove like some direct causal relationships, that was not possible. So uh, the, the algorithm can actually uh, handle both uh, sources of information. Now, if you go to, um, if you also include all data sets, so some data sets, uh, we call that measure only a part of these variables, and uh, also, there is one data set that is uh, uh, has selection bias too. Then you can prove uh, <clears throat> even more relationships and actually prove that some of these relationships had to be direct. Nothing else intervenes. Okay? So you could go like to uh, the executives in this company and say, well, based on all the information that I have, both your data before the uh, intervention out and after your promotion, essentially, and also by taking an independent uh, data set, uh, your prior notes that you can use this is how you could try to reduce the medical or cost of the life. Now, this is uh, if you ask the program, if you do the query to the program to prove or disprove uh, causal relationships, but you can also ask other questions. Particularly inter interesting is the fact that you can ask and prove some things between variables that you never observed together in any data set. So if you, if you go back, I mean, um, uh, there is no data set that measures simultaneously these two things. So you cannot even compute the, the statistical association. You never have been measured there for the same people. And yet, if you ask the program, it can prove that these two, um, these re uh, relations in red don't exist. Uh, Raggedness doesn't uh, cause medical cost or vice versa directly, uh, and Raggedness doesn't um, cause liability cost uh, directly or indirectly. So this is um, a, a specific example how would you use this type of algorithms in a business application or equivalently a medical application where you have case control studies, interventional studies, observational studies? Okay, so um, key points is that we have different distributions. We cannot just naively pull them together, but they all come from the same causal mechanism. We change our perspective. We're looking for one causal uh, mechanism that fits to all data sets. In this way, we can handle uh, data sets that measure different things under different conditions, perhaps under different and also include uh, causal prior knowledge. Uh, we need to identify 
all the solutions um, implicitly at least and uh, query the system whether you know some, all the solutions are free or not on this, uh, we exploit the fact that you know a, a lot of researchers have built like very fast uh, such facilities or answer set programs or some other logic based engines at least for computers now okay and with the vision that actually we can do causal discovery in practical applications, taking into consideration all sorts of uh, sources of data and knowledge. So <clears throat> having said that, I would like to really acknowledge and credit uh, all my team in uh, um and also um, collaborators that um, and, and colleagues that have given um, feedback parts of this presentation and the funding. Having said that, if you'd like, I can also give you a sneak preview on some of the things that we work on in the lab. If I do, I have a, a few minutes. Okay. So first of all, like on this direction, there's really lots to be done. And one is scalability. Okay, because uh, so far, for the most general scenario, we can go up to 10 variables, 15 variables, and that's it. Uh, and relaxing assumptions, improving robustness, uh, making quantitative predictions, incorporating information and data uh, about time, uh, and so forth. And actually, um, we, we are going to apply this to a real life insurance problem uh, commercially. So um, hopefully, you know, it's going to work. We'll, we'll see. That you know. Okay, uh, in terms of feature selection, uh, we also have uh, some progress, and feature selection is very connected to the, um, it's a first step to many causal discovery algorithms. So we have uh, extended the forward backward selection algorithm uh, to by one uh, to three orders of magnitude in terms of speed. Also, to be able to return uh, not a single solution, but all equivalent solutions. We find it uh, misleading when you do um, when you try to find, for example, the risk factors for a biosignature. You go to the biology and say to the biologist and say it's these five genes that uh, diagnose your disease, when in fact there may be other sets of genes that are equally good. Um, so we try to return all um, possible solutions. And we extended also the algorithm for big data. And when I say big, dense data, uh, meaning like tens of millions of uh, rows, tens of millions of columns running in parallel on the cloud and uh, Spark. So this is coming up soon. Uh, also, uh, we take a different approach to causality, which has to do with what they do in engineering. So in engineering, physics, and all of the um, other uh, sciences, uh, they model causality with ordinary differential equations or partial differential equations or even stochastic differential equations. So we have an algorithm that uh, tries to learn the ordinary differential equation from data. So far, most work has been focusing on uh, given uh, a known system to estimate the parameters, but we won't also want to estimate the physical laws, the equations that we take the system. So this is uh, also uh, up for submission. Uh, we have a, an R package where we try to uh, implement these algorithms. Uh, so we, the R package so far has uh, our algorithm, our, our, some of the algorithms for variable selection also focusing on being able to use it with uh, mixed data, uh, including survival data, survival analysis, including uh, time course data. So you can actually do uh, variable selection, selecting trajectories uh, that are uh, performing condition dependency on trajectories, like this tra condition of this trajectory, the gene, um, the, this uh, gene becomes independent of some other one. Uh, and also, this algorithm can find like multiple uh, solutions that we uh, 
and soon we'll have like also more uh, and better cause of discovery out there in the Python stream. Um, and another very important direction that we work on is automating machine learning. I think like um, we have more data than people to analyze them, so we need to do something about that. And what we can is uh, build uh, software that uh, you keep the data set and you automatically like select the best algorithm, figure it out, uh, the best parameter sets, uh, rather for validation and so forth. In, in the near future, it's going to be uh, on the cloud. Uh, it's going to paralyze all of that stuff and has other tricks like caching and very stopping and things like that to make it like uh, much more faster and computational. Um, Also, we are building um, a tool where you can load your single cell data and uh, visualize the application of uh, photo discovery algorithms. And one of these tools, uh, we can open architecture, so if you have a photo discovery algorithm, you can um, uh, put it on the tool, it's going to appear on the drop down menus, and uh, you can run and visualize your, uh, the result. So, uh, right now, we focus on mass cytometry and flow cytometry single cell data. Uh, we will extend it, hopefully, to other types of single cell data, eventually maybe to other omics uh, data. You can do some um, simple uh, analysis, like at the association networks or find the interest associations and so forth, well, <laughs> but also in the end, you can uh, run some uh, basic proposal discussion. Uh, okay, so these are some of the stuff that we're working on. Um, I, I, I also want to mention, because later on I'm meeting with some of you, and maybe you would like to discuss uh, further some of this uh, direction. Uh, okay, well, that's it. Thank you very much. I'm ready to take your questions, if there are any. <laughs> I really have to also apologize for this side of, of the room. Uh, so, uh, if you have questions, I'll start with you. No? Yes? So, um, we're the math makes sense, but um, the selection, just a model of the data selection. Actually, you Pearl also mentioned in one of his uh, papers that meta-analysis is like comparing apples and oranges to make inference out bananas. So <laughs> yeah, people have been doing that. Um, okay, so I guess the question is uh, in a specific domain like uh, breast cancer, you have different types of heterogeneity, if I understand correctly, meaning like different uh, diagnostic tests, and um, different um, um, treatments and, and this stuff. Uh, well, in terms of different treatments, I think uh, it could fall into this uh, direction because uh, it's a different type of an intervention that you're using. So you, you just have uh, data and you model the intervention with one drug and then the other data from the model. Uh, 
but uh, obviously, yes, yeah, this is a couple of different kind of things uh, so uh, so Some sort of Absolutely. So the fundamental assumption is you have a, a single true causal model. It's unknown, but it's one. Actually, I, I can also think like other situations. Uh, so in low cytometry or mass cytometry, in single cell uh, measurements, you have different cells. They, they have a, a different uh, uh, structure potential. So you, you shouldn't pull all the data together. Um, uh, you, I, th I think you need different methods to uh, be able to generalize to the type of heterogeneity that uh, you mentioned. For example, the ability to learn from uh, mixtures of causal models uh, or learn simultaneously multiple causal models for different subpopulations or different cells that have some things in common. So, for example, uh, different cells of the uh, autoimmune uh, of, of the immune system may have uh, may be different and may have a different uh, causal uh, structure, but it's somewhat similar. Okay, so how can you like um, make use of these similarities um, better than than benefit? So, so I think this is a very good direction for future research. But first, we need to identify exactly the, the type of heterogeneity and how to make it mathematical. Uh, what you mentioned, at least, I, I still don't know like, exactly how to make mathematical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, the question is what happens with feedback, particularly in uh, biological systems where it's pervasive and omnipresent, I would say. Um, this is what we came to discover ourselves also. Uh, but it was not obvious from the beginning. I mean, maybe it was obvious that there is feedback, but it wasn't obvious how serious it is, whether uh, the methods would still work uh, even in uh, violations of these assumptions. So, uh, well, the, the first thing that I have to say is that uh, there are there exist algorithms that try to handle feedback based on this approach, and they allow uh, cyclic networks. However, uh, you have to make the assumption of linearity to be a handle, uh, handle feedback. If uh, relations are not linear, then uh, you may have uh, chaotic systems, and, and uh, the disappearance criteria doesn't hold actually a nonlinear system. Um, so, uh, because of this problem, it, it, it is exactly what prompted us to try. Uh, so, 
totally different directions uh, like like this one. So <coughs> develop methods that try to learn differential equation models that can handle. Okay. Uh, what we will have to do in the future is try to marry these two approaches. Uh, nevertheless, in the in between, one thing that uh, one could or should do, like to handle feedback, is to get uh, temporal data, uh, use uh, dynamic Bayesian networks or dynamic versions of uh, algorithms. But I think without temporal information uh, in uh, systems that have a lot of feedback, uh, you know, hopeless. Um, you would agree or not? No. Okay. I believe in the True, but you can have your fryers. <laughs> okay. Other questions? Yes. Ah, uh, I was wondering actually the, with the discussion that went on earlier about players in the 80s. I was wondering if you thought about or if this would work on what kind of representation or the elephant approach. In the image representation. So if you have a, a multi net uh, that represents the different causal structures that they're discussing or different graphs, um, and you present them together as the to localized. That's represented in one larger graph. Just click on that node. It sounds like that's amenable to your approach because you've got something you can write down. If, if population is equal to one, Yes. Okay. So, are you are you talking about how to extend uh, this approach to to the problem of the problem? Yes. Yes. It could be late or it could be late. Right. The question is like, uh, did you assume anything about the commonalities, or did you treat them essentially as totally independent problems? Because it sounds to me you're just, it, it, you, you would get uh, the exact same results as if you were trying to learn to independent the complete. Well, maybe not for your, I mean, usually yes, but I think maybe your approach has to use some of the information that's common with all the different functions and that's common with all You mean uh, prior knowledge? Uh, that or you would like to if you know that you know, population one and population two are different in a lot of ways, but in both of them, um, X is be connected to Y. You can decode that as a constraint, and now you have the information from both. That needs to be satisfied. So, so some extensions that are really, uh, I think, interesting is, uh, first of all, handling <laughs> uh, mixtures of distribution or uh, that should come from similar uh, networks, but you don't know how similar like that. This is uh, conceptually equivalent to multi-task learning, you know, where you have different tasks, but uh, you assume they have a, a common feature space. Uh, the other thing is uh, extending uh, these approaches to multi-scale systems. Which I have no idea how to go about, but uh, that would be very interesting. And the third thing is uh, how to incorporate uh, all sorts of temporal what do you mean by multi scale? Uh, so, for example, uh, you, you have the causal networks inside cells, but you also have like uh, kind of how they interact between them, and then you have like how they interact like a larger scale and so forth. But there's a uh, class of model. Yes, uh, yeah, I, I actually uh, know, know a little bit about the material, but I, I'm saying this would be a, I think a very good direction to 
Uh, okay. Uh, other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much.